All right, uh, let's get started. I think uh, we're, we got enough people uh, and get on the way here. So first off, I wanna say thank you for joining us on uh, CRISPR Office Hours. Really excited to have everyone on board today and as well as our panelists and uh, co-hosting with Kevin. So we host CRISPR Office Hours every Thursday at 9 a.m. to help the scientific community navigate through, navigate through these challenging times. We wanna make sure that people can ask questions. We have folks on here and they can talk about how they're handling the situation in their labs or their companies and be as interactive as possible. So for housekeeping items, just to make sure everyone's on board, we will be having a recording of this webinar or office hours and we'll be hosting this on YouTube that you can look at afterwards and share as you wish. And our goal really again is to let folks from the community chat, send in their questions, have our panelists answer them and make sure it's an interactive discussion. The more interaction, the better it is for everybody. And also just, you know, let people express what they think they're dealing with through COVID-19 and how it's impacting them and how others are solving those issues too. So more interaction, the better for all of us. So with that, my name is Aditya Vempati. I'm the VP of Marketing at Synthigo and really excited to do Christmas, CRISPR office hours every Thursday with my host, Kevin Holden. Thanks, Aditya. Uh, welcome everybody to CRISPR office hours. Uh, I'm your co-host, Kevin Holden, head of science at Synthigo. So uh, the title for office hours this week is Keep Calm and CRISPR on during COVID-19 MIT edition. So as we talked about last week, uh, Keep Calm and Carry On was originally um, a poster produced by the British government during World War II uh, as part of a public assurance campaign to remind people that even in the face of danger, uh, it's not important to be paralyzed by fear, but to stay collected, calm, and to keep on with what, and, and get on with what needs to be done. So we think the slogan has never been more appropriate than now, and uh, as we all do our part to try to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And you know, from all of us at Synthigo, we'd like to remind you uh, and all of our genome engineer audience uh, uh, in, in the audience today to keep calm and CRISPR on. Uh, so today we're gonna hear about some truly brilliant uses of the CRISPR technology to fight the pandemic. That's right, Kevin. A special thank you from all of us and to all the genome engineers attending today. Please stick around to then so you can learn how you can get your free Keep Calm and CRISPR on t-shirt. Of course, as delivered in a classic Synthigo soft cotton style. So with that, let's meet the panel today. Uh, Kevin and I are very excited and proud to welcome two outstanding scientists to CRISPR office hours, Jonathan Gutenberg and Omar Abudaya both McGovern Fellows and fellow PIs at MIT. And they've been here since leaving Fang Zhang's lab at the Broad Institute, and they've gone on to find a new lab at MIT. Omar, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you. We're excited to be here. Yeah, looking forward to this. Excited. So as we get started, we always like to make sure to have a you know interactive poll question, get the uh, juices flowing, get everyone in pace, and have the panelists also answer. So our poll question we have today, panelists, please send in your, uh, or sorry, panelists, you can tell me, and then uh, folks on the line, send in via chat uh, which option you would choose. So what are you missing the most during shelter in place? Uh, travel, going out to dinner, being in the lab, sporting events, uh, seeing friends and family, and I don't know who was evil enough to put this on here, but commuting. So... <laughs> I'll let folks uh, chime in here. And so Omar, what, what do you miss the most here? Well, being in lab, I guess, wouldn't really count since I'm basically still in lab working on COVID tests. So that, I'd probably have to say all you can eat sushi. I feel like <laughs> you can't quite recreate the all you can eat experience with Uber Eats or delivery or takeout. So you have to, yeah, that'd be mine. Yeah. What about you, Jonathan? I think hanging out with people not by Zoom We've done a couple uh, Zoom hangouts with friends, and it it's not terrible, but it doesn't really recapitulate like actual physical interaction. I don't think people evolved to talk to a computer screen. So yeah, it'll be nice to catch up with people like you know in real life when this is all over. What about you, Kevin? Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Omar and number two, dining out. I miss dining out. I I guess what I really what I really miss is the the Taco Bell dine in experience. I just haven't had that for a while, so. Especially the one in Pacifica Beach, Beach right? right? Yeah, it's a good one. So, uh, 
a lot of the audience I'm looking here, they actually are picking almost uh, a la carte style, all of them, one through five, travel, going out to dinner, being the lab, sporting events, friends and family. Surprisingly, we've had one person, Sage uh, from Bio Networks. I like my commute. No time for podcast these days. That's uh, that's a new way of looking at your commute. So with that being said, thanks uh, for everyone participating. And Kevin, can you re reorient us with the model that we've been discussing for the past few weeks? Yeah, sure thing. So for the past few weeks, uh, we've been discussing this model that was put out by the Linus Group um, back on our first episode of CRISPR Office Hours. So they surveyed over 2,000 scientists about their thoughts and activities uh, during the pandemic. Um, so just to look at this, uh, this model, we're probably still persisting through this golden interim phase. Um, last week, we heard from a biotech startup in San Francisco about how they're coping um, and some of the COVID-19 research they've collaborated on. Um, and today we're bringing two scientists who are not only involved in starting biotech companies, but also run a genome engineering academic lab at MIT. So um, they're gonna tell us uh, a bit about how their lab has remained agile, operational, um, and continues to develop new resources and tools um, for fighting COVID-19 as we move into this uh, transition phase. Yeah. I okay mean... guys, yeah, well, thanks for being on the show uh, today. Uh, so can you go ahead and move the slide? Thank you. Um, thanks for being on the show. Can you guys tell us a bit first about what your lab's about and how it's set up? Because it's kind of a, a very unique lab situation. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, so we're co-PIs of our group. So we're running it jointly. And I guess that means everyone that we hire, I guess, reports to both of us. Uh, we kind of have collaborative meetings where people meet with both of us. We have subgroups, we have lab meeting. Um, we have brainstorms. I mean, I think it's, it's a little bit unique, I think, for people in the group to have two bosses, but I think overall it makes a much richer scientific experience because there's a lot more um, sort of scientific expertise in the group to be able to you know debug or come up with new ideas, a lot of creativity. I think we think in very complementary ways and have you know different things that we bring from you know like medical background to computational backgrounds. Um, so I think it makes for a much richer sort of scientific environment. Um, and I guess, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you think about like comparing, like most academic labs, you have the PI and, you know, their word is law. But if you think about a company or, you know, other situations where you have these things, you have checks and balances, right? And it, it's always nice to have a second opinion. So we'll often have different ideas and we can spot check each other. And so that gives us, I think, a better approach to a lot of things because, you know, in the situation where you have somebody and there's no feedback, it really leads you down certain paths where you can really get stuck. So that's fun. And, you know, it's just a nice social interaction because, you know, we get to all hang out like us in the group. So it's uh, I think it makes a really nice environment. Um, and so far it's been really great to kind of incubate ideas and, and see what we can do even in this time. So yeah, it's, it's certainly unique, um, but it's been working very well. Cool. Can you, can you guys talk about, so first of all, we, before we talk about um, how you guys are uh, handling the, the situ current situation we're in, what do, you, what do you normally do at your lab? Yeah, so actually I think the next slide is a, is a great small uh, introduction to our lab. So our lab basically focuses on the development of molecular tools from natural diversity um, with CRISPR as a focus, but not our only focus. So you might be aware that CRISPR is a bacterial immune system, an adaptive immune system. And it's been, of course, immensely valuable, but it's not the first tool to come from natural diversity, of course, GFP, optogenetic, viral vectors, and it certainly won't be the last. So we like to focus our lab on using hey, yeah. these these naturally diverse um, kind of sources of tools that we can then uh, turn into kind of molecular engineering approaches. Um, and we're doing that across a couple of things with CRISPR and also looking at things for delivery or for other approaches to kind of understanding uh, diversity in biology. So it's, um, it's a lot of work that's kind of like both similar to what we've done before. So we'll talk a little bit about diagnostics and kind of other RNA targeting tools, but we're also expanding into new directions by mining this natural diversity. I have me. Cool, can we, we just remind everyone in the audience please to mute their microphones uh, while they're listening. Thank you. Yeah. All right, um, and uh, do you wanna move on to the next slide please? 
Yeah, so, you know, a lot of, well, a lot of work of our group um, has been kind of to d develop new genome engineering technologies to make gene therapy better. Um, sometimes unexpected surprises come along the way. So while we were sort of mining a lot of new enzymes, we came across uh, certain ones that were not as great for gene editing, but uh, could actually be a lot better for reporting um, on the presence of DNA or RNA. So um, we sort of took that tack and ended up developing these really sensitive diagnostic assays uh, using some of these new enzymes like Cas13 or Cas12 um, that we had come across. And the basic idea is you can program a protein to recognize a specific DNA or RNA from bacteria or viruses, um, or even uh, you know things like tumors or um, other disease signatures that can be present in someone's DNA. Um, and you can basically spike in some sort of reporter that can either fluoresce or um, sort of be visualized on a paper strip. And basically, if you have the presence of, you know, that bacterial or viral sequence, you'll get a very uh, uh, quick readout. And so here we're showing a fluorescence-based readout. Um, and we were able to show that we could do this uh, for even just single molecules, so like single bacterial cells or single viral cells. Um, and we've been able to uh, show that's also quite cheap. And so some of the earlier iterations of the technology were um, less than a dollar in terms of cost of goods um, and, you know, could also be easily transported anywhere in the world because a lot of the components can be freeze dried and uh, independent of the cold chain. Um, and so we call this technology Sherlock. And I think if we go to the next slide, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, different applications uh, that I think, you know, very sensitive molecular diagnostics can uh, benefit from. And so, uh, you know, we're quite excited where we can take the technology. We're still pushing it further um, in our own lab. We also uh, co-founded a company called Sherlock Biosciences um, that's trying to actually translate it into the clinic um, as well. Um, and I guess as a segue to you were asking, how is our group um, sort of pivoted and sort of maintained uh, sort of activity and progress during sort of this COVID uh, pandemic. Well, we've, you know, thought about how we can really use Sherlock uh, for COVID. So maybe you can yeah, yeah, so, cover that. Yeah. I mean, it, normally uh, because Sherlock was occurring a lot of the company, Sherlock Biosciences, we had pivoted to kind of these additional, you know, new areas. But um, when COVID started, or started COV2, started really becoming this emerging threat back in January, um, we very early on thought, well, this could be a very uh, good application for Sherlock. So um, we started working on that um, pretty much uh, end of January. And um, if you go to the next slide, in uh, basically, mid-February, we got out a, pr a white paper where we could adapt the Sherlock technology to detect the uh, genome at a couple different places of CoV-2. And so we can do a very rapid COVID diagnostic. And that's uh, something that we then have released to the community and multiple groups, both in the US, but also there's been good adoption in Germany and Thailand, have been really eager to use this protocol because it doesn't require any sort of complex thermocycling. It doesn't require any instrumentation for readout. All you have to do is dip this strip in and then you can read it out. So it's been something that has been very widely adopted. And then internally, as people have been using this, we've been getting feedback on questions of how could this test be better? How could we you know, scale this test? How could this be used to actually address this immediate need? And we've been essentially doing a lot of optimizations in chemistry on getting something that can be really truly point of care, um, where ideally there can be almost no required um, uh, expertise or anything involved in the readout. And that would allow us to really scale this because to you know, really get us out of this situation that we're in and reopen society, um, it's gonna require a lot of testing and we're gonna need a variety of solutions. And one of the solutions will have to be probably something that can be tested very rapidly. So we don't require on centralized sequencing or even centralized uh, running of qPCR or other molecular tests. And can be done in places like a workplace where you could screen people coming in. Um, so we're very excited about optimizing this um, and getting it better so it can actually be scaled to this because um, uh, I think it's something that's really needed. Uh, so it's been an exciting time for CRISPR diagnostics because if you had asked us, you know, in, you know, January 1st, 2020, oh, you know, 
where's CRISPR diagnostics going to be in three months, we'd say, oh, you know, probably on the same trajectory that it's been going, which is quite well. But I think um, this has really shown the need for very, very rapid deployment of these tools and for rapid development of new capabilities that will probably show up in other diseases as well, influenza, TB. You know, people are very excited about using this, uh, this capability. Hey, Jonathan, um, can you, um, so we heard a little bit um, about another technology last week um, using the CAS-12 approach. Is, is that a main point of differentiation, just the ability to make it immediately field deployable? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of groups, you know, of course, Mammoth Bio, um, Biosciences is, is working on uh, other CRISPR-based technologies. And I think a lot of groups want to make this immediately deployable. Of course, we can't speak to what they're working on right now, but their paper that came out was in impressive and showed that um, they could have it with very good concordance with P, uh, qPCR, but at the same time, they require multiple steps and uh, pipetting. Um, so I think it's something that multiple groups are working on, us and you know probably other groups as well, are trying to solve those so we can get uh, well deployed. So I think that's one of the next generations, really getting this democratized testing out. When, when, you, when you do one of these tests, how long does it take? So you talked about like testing people when they come into the office or something, or um, maybe a supermarket, like how, how, how quickly can you run one of these tests with the lateral flow? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the original uh, sort of open source protocol and kit we distributed back in February was about 45 minutes, um, but we're actively working on making it sort of a simple 20 to 30 minute test. Yeah. Oh, that'd be so cool. We're, we're, we're actually about to release that soon. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, timing is always something that changes with, how the test is developed and you know how it's packaged and manufactured, um, but yeah, I mean the goal is to get something that is probably sub one hour rather than you know three or four hours. And the nice thing about a consumable is that you could give it to multiple people and they could run it in parallel. So that's the great thing about you know reducing the burden of instrumentation and having orthogonal ways to reout through CRISPR. That's great. I, I know you guys. Uh, I know you guys are, are still work very closely with your former PI Fung at, at the Broad Institute. Um, can you can you talk about how that all came together? How you kind of coalesced at the beginning of January? I know you reached out to me, um, and then of course you guys have been involved with with other um, uh, ventures that he's been working on as well, including an app, right? So maybe can you guys talk about that a little bit and how how you how at first kind of you guys all got together and figured out let's do this? Yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh... We've, I guess, since leaving the lab almost a year ago, we've stayed in close contact with Fung uh, to either, you know, brainstorm ideas and, of course, you know, to help sort of translate the technology through the company we co-founded together. Um, and basically, in, in January, um, we started just, or all of our conversations started focusing about what was happening in China. And so we'd be, like, sharing links late into the night, like, at midnight on our text thread, just, like, being like, this is crazy, like, this is taking off, like, why is the rest of the world not talking? about this like this is this could easily um come to the u.s like very soon and so and you know of course fung um has chinese roots and knows a lot of people there um and so i think we all felt uh compelled that you know maybe we should do something like we have this platform we have this technology um why don't we start early to sort of you know make a test that could be easily deployed anywhere around the world for a very low cost um and so i think after a few weeks of sharing links and you know uh, seeing this thing evolve, we were like, let's finally do something. So early February, we started um, working on the test. And it was kind of crazy because uh, I think in a matter of like, it must have been like one or two weeks, it was already up and running and we had posted the open source protocol. I think uh, Fung did a lot of the actual uh, wet lab experiments at his own bench. Um, it's cool to see him go was, back to lab. Yeah, yeah he, was, <laughs> he was very excited about trying Sherlock out uh, himself. Um, and so yeah, that's how it evolved. And um, I think, you know, we have basically wrapped up efforts since then. I think we were all working on it part time back then. Um, but after, you know, seeing how it's evolved and how it's affected the entire country, it's all we kind of think about and focus on now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really, I mean, like, you know, we could shoot, you know, you guys an email and, you know, can you put this on your to synthesize? And um, yeah, we can get guides very rapidly, which yeah. is nice. And it's, and also, I think something that, you know, people don't always think about, but like, you know, synthetic RNAs, you know, they're not just for Cas9. So it's something that can be very valuable for Cas13, Cas12, what have you. Kevin, I think I'm, you're muted. I'm, yeah, I just woke up. 
Um, sorry, I think uh, <laughs> Fung's also been involved with this um, with this app, the How You yeah. Feel app. How do you feel? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So How We Feel is a is a really cool app. It basically is a self reporting app that you know, of course, with one thing of monitoring the spread. Um, in an ideal world, um, we would have contact tracing where you get someone who is infected, and you can contact trace everybody that that person has interacted with and then we can you know isolate those populations and that was very effective in China and has been effective in South Korea and other places now of course it's too late to do wide scale contact tracing in a manual way but if people can self report on how they feel and if they have somewhat symptoms or other aspects that could be indicative of the virus it allows you know communities and states, um, for example, state of Connecticut, uh, to track the outbreak of the virus, because one of the most important tools about combating this is information. So How We Feel is an app um, that Fung uh, did with his old, uh, I think they're, they're high school friends. So Fung has a, is really tight with the found, co-founder of Pinterest, uh, Ben Silverman. Um, so Fung reached out to him, or they got started talking about this, and they're like, we should build this app. And then they involve a lot of other groups. Um, another former member of the lab, Okir Shalem, is involved, as well as some groups in Israel. And um, it's really become this amazing uh, initiative. And uh, the state of Connecticut, and I think the state of Vermont, are also adopting it um, to do tracing and, well, not literal contact tracing, but self-reporting. And um, it was actually crazy. You know, we were on in lab I think, two days ago, and you know, we're during incubation, and check CNN, and they're talking about this app. So it's, um, I think they have close to half a million users right now, and I would encourage you guys to install. I don't it. mind. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel, Kevin? Uh, I'm feeling good today. I've just checked in, so. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, this is kind of cool. It shows you how many people uh, feel good in your city, and how many people are not feeling good. It gives you an idea. Um, about uh, what's going on in your community. Um, I think uh, they said over 150,000 people have checked in today. Yeah, it's, I think that these, you know, these different streams of information are gonna be very valuable. You know, self-reporting, obviously diagnostics from either centralized locations or you know, essentially doing distributed tests using CRISPR or other methods. But there's even other cool things. Um, there's a group at MIT that is actually sequencing the sewage because you know people talk about saliva or nasopharyngeal aspirates, but there's a lot of actual shedded um, genomes. They're not infectious necessarily, but uh, COVID genomes in sewage. So you can actually sequence sewage and use it as a metric. And um, they actually reached out to us to see if they could do something on site with uh, Sherlock, but. Um, it's kind of all these different efforts that allow us to really survey this because really, you know, social distancing is becoming effective, but without, you know, really good controls, we'll lose out on, uh, you know, second or third waves because it's not like a one-time thing. It will probably come back and there will be waves and we have to be um, vigilant about that. Cool. So those, those are question. Um, what is the app again? The app is called how we feel. Sorry, we didn't put a plug on here for that uh, <laughs> slide, but um yeah, I think uh, Omar just put it in the chat. So thanks for doing that. Um, I guess yeah. uh, we had another question come in just while we're on this topic before we, before we move on to other applications and, and things you're working on. Um, the, the other question was, did you did you target specifically like the E gene or the N gene in SARS-CoV-2? Was there a particular target you knew you wanted to go after? Yeah. So um, when we were designing the actual guides, we incorporated a couple different layers of information. Um, one, of course, is that which areas are normally most conserved between different viruses, because obviously we don't want to necessarily have something that will hit all coronaviruses, because um, that could lead to false positives. So we did an evolutionary conservation analysis. Um, and then we also used um, a bit of internal data on which guides work best. Um, so we incorporate that a bit. And then lastly, um, we took a bit of prior knowledge about, you know, which genes during the COVID-19 life cycle or the SARS-CoV-2 life cycle um, are replicated more, which I believe is the N gene gets a ton of replication. Um, and so we chose preferentially different parts of those. So. And in future optimizations, we're looking at more of those different factors as we go towards um, getting this test out for, you know, V, two, three, whatever you have. So I'd say really what we were mostly driven by was we don't want to have false pauses from other viruses and we can throw all the other things in. That's great. Aditya, you want to move on to the, to the next slide and maybe, um, maybe Omar, you guys can tell us a little bit about 
um, some other applications uh, of, of using uh, other genome, app, app, genome engineering applications your labs are working on? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I think we wanted to highlight that our lab uh, also does just a lot more than sort of Sherlock and diagnostics. Um, a lot of our work had been taking some of the RNA targeting tools that we developed in grad school and trying to use them for better RNA knockdown or modulating RNA translation, RNA imaging and tracking. Um, we've done RNA editing, like doing precise base editing, kind of like base editors for DNA, but instead for RNA, where you can make A to G or C to T changes, and you can do them in a very reversible or temporary fashion. Um, that can be useful for when you want reversible gene editing, like if you want to um, help regenerate cells post, you know, heart or liver failure, or modulate other things like pain or inflammation. Um, or even if you want some sort of reversible gene editing, kind of like a pill for gene therapy rather than just permanent gene editing. So um, I think there's a lot of exciting directions there. And then more broadly, we've been taking a lot of these enzymes for doing better programmable insertion. Um, you know, there's still a lot of uh, issues with current uh, gene editing tools, especially trying to insert large payloads at specific sites. Um, and so we've, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of different directions there as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really exciting because, you know, a lot of these tools, Cas9, obviously, but Cas12, Cas13, um, they check a lot of cool boxes. Um, one, of course, they're very, very easy to use once they're developed. So Cas9, you know, if you had told me in 2008, hey, I'll be go able to go to this website, this nifty looking website, and, you know, in three days be able to, you know, knock out genes or whatever, um, it, yeah, you know, you'd say you, you must be lying. And I think that's a lot of that power is because these molecular machines that are very elegant, um, you know, our cells and the cells you're editing do all the work. So it's really nice to be able to mine these, but also it's great because they form these chassis as this slide represents where we can play around with them and use them as a playground, just like Cas9 has led to base editing and prime editing and activation. Cas13, you know, has this whole slew of things. And then lastly, there's enormous diversity of Cas9s, Cas13s, what have you, that allows us to fine tune and improve and do many other things uh, by sampling from the zoo. So, you, you know, Cas9, 12, 13, what have you, are not the only CRISPR proteins. And CRISPR is not the only system that has those different, you know, aspects of programmability, easy uh, use, and uh, wide diversity. So I think it's very exciting to think about different ways to mine from nature still um, that we're looking into, uh, you know, how can we use natural ways to even get into cells better? Are there things out there that we can take advantage of? So um, it's an exciting time. And, um, even though it's a weird time, we're, we're very excited about, you know, all the applications of these technologies for COVID so, so and for other causes. So, so you guys have been, uh, because you kind of have been in this at the beginning, um, you know, working on some applications for COVID-19 through the diagnostics. Have, have you continued doing uh, your other research in the background? And I, and I guess maybe, um, you know, my other question is like, how do, how do other labs, like how are they going to um, try and try and get back into what they were doing before? You guys, are you guys continuing on with this or are you just going to pick it up later? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have uh, a number of computational projects that are continuing on. So a lot of, um, we've tried to uh, have a lot of the lab folks that are sitting at home either, you know, work on data analysis or start preparing papers uh, for submission. So that kind of work is ongoing. We have a few essential projects um, as do other labs for like sort of mouse experiments, for example, that have been going on or long term, like, you know, cell culture experiments that have to finish. Um, so we have a small percentage of that kind of work still going on, but the vast majority, I would say, is uh, diagnostic focused. Um, and I mean, I think there there is flexibility. Like MIT, while it is closed, I mean, they, there are a lot of labs that still have or are trying to finish up essential experiments. Um, and so, but for the most part, it is quite empty and and odd, uh, especially since we're in a neuroscience building. So most of the labs here are not working um, on COVID. Yeah, yeah, it's like a ghost town. It's almost eerie. So, um, so, so, so you guys have kind of been able to do this sort of like agile development and move into something, you know, that's, that's really relevant. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen a few other labs across um, the country and the world now um, just like suddenly pivot and get on to doing some work that can help fight the pandemic. Um, and this is great, right? This is like we're able to use all of our, all the great scientific minds in the world coming together. Um, do you think this is actually going to change how people do research, the way that everyone's been able to like you know, quickly move and, and do things, even though while other groups have been shut down? Certainly. I mean, 
I think that there's a lot of kind of weird uh, paradoxes that have been exposed by this. Um, for I think one of the biggest ones is, is publishing. So, you know, you, you all these, you know, scientific publishers who say, oh, you know, we're opening up all of our COVID related research um, to be open access so we can make it much more, more available. And um, the implicit kind of parallel there is that, well, by making it close, we're actually slowing down research. And there's been a huge um, adoption of BioArchive and MedArchive preprints um, that has really been able to accelerate a lot of it. But it's also shown um, other questions. I mean, you get these BioArchive preprints or MedArchive preprints that are like, oh, you know, we think that this is a man-made virus that has parts of HIV in it. And it says, you know, it's, it's really accelerating the preprint uh, aspect to people being aware, well, it's great that we can have these preprints, but we should have some, uh, you know, oversight on that as well. Um, and then otherwise, I mean, you know, I think it's really uh, pushed a lot of different collaboration. I think people, some scientists are having the idea, hey, you know, you know, can I just drop in on your group meeting and you can, you know, drop in on the group meeting of anybody in the world where you say, let me just, you know, join your Zoom call. And that's led to a lot of interesting, cool collaborations. Um, so I think that it makes people much more open and they realize that, you know, it's not just about publishing or getting this through, but like yet your research can have a real, you know, actual uh, concrete benefit, um, which is, I think, hopefully people will retain that when they come back. Um, yeah. So the, uh, so, so the taking the collaboration model of uh, Omar and Jonathan's lab worldwide. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Speaking of this, so when, when your lab is back up and, and running and, uh, in terms of everyone can come in, um, are you, are you guys are still building out the lab and um, looking to recruit people, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're still looking for you know, graduate students, uh, postdocs, uh, technicians, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, especially because we've received a couple grants recently, um, but <laughs> given the current circumstances, are not um, able to hire as much as uh, we'd we'd like to. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah, especially with like a plug for a, a, oh, a, a for a computational person. So we're building our computational pipeline and kind of like you know, as mining this diversity um, because uh, I think that that's always something that's really powerful and. So, also something that's you know right now you can do you can do from anywhere so um that's that's pretty nice um so just if you go back one slide um so our current lab is at mcgovern um and you know we all the work that we're doing is supported by an amazing group of people um eleanor rohan austin dennis elvira are all of our lab members brennan is a former lab member of ours um, who is now doing a master's in um, new york but uh, he also you know was foundational, a lot of uh, computational things. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're always looking to grow the team and, and engage in conversations with people, Sherlock related or otherwise. Um, and, uh, but I think it's also important to look backwards. So the next slide is uh, kind of our uh, not so humble origins because, you know, it was a big lab, but um, uh, yeah, we have a lot to owe to, you know, our past mentors and um, collaborators and of course to Feng Zhang, um, who, you know, it's, it's really exciting to actually work with him again. Um, one thing about the independence, we're like, oh, we won't get to work with Feng again. That, you know, it's necessary, but it also sucks in a way. Um, but now, you know, I think that all the kind of societal norms of independence and everything are kind of thrown out the window and we are like, this is a great opportunity for us to just team up. So it's been fun working with him again, um, you know, and collaborating, but yeah. Um, cool. So we got a few questions from the audience and uh, I want to get, get to them. Obviously we want to make it as interactive as possible. So folks on the line, please send them in via chat and we'll get to them. Good. And so uh, first question, um, can Sherlock be used commercially to test for this virus? What is its anticipated false positive rate, false negative, Robert? Yeah. So I think this is a great question. Um, I think there's a, uh, a lot of work trying to be done to make this happen. It's not commercially available yet, um, but uh, you know, Sherlock Biosciences has announced that they're working on a test. Um, our collaboration between us and Fung, you know, between MIT and the Broad, are also trying to develop some sort of test kit that we can get um, out there for people, especially for point of care testing. So I think hopefully over the coming you know weeks or months there will be something um, available. Um, and in terms of false positive and false negative rate, I mean, I think we'll have some clinical validation that we'll release soon. 
Um, but in general, the validation on you know dozens of patients we've tested has uh, looked very, very good, and we're excited to um, at some point release that. So. A uh, question related to this that we got through the chat. Thanks for that, Omar. Uh, yeah. Is do you think COVID situation will ease the regulations on diagnostics in the future? Do you already see this happening? Uh, I think it'll ease it somewhat, but you know, I think it's a double-edged sword because you actually perhaps it's ease it too much already because you have all these serological tests on the market looking for antibodies. And there's a large question as to how reliable these are. And if people are taking an antibody test and it says, oh, you know, you've been infected, you're immune now, and they go out into public and they are an asymptomatic spreader and they infect 10 people, that's really bad. So I think it'll create a, a dialogue about the loosening of both therapeutic and diagnostic um, regulations. But um, I think that that can have good and bad outcomes. Um, you know, it's, it's a really, we, we don't want to move too fast. Obviously, you know, when people say, oh, you know, chloroquine is the magic drug and then the, the randomized controlled trials say, eh, maybe not. Um, you know, it's, it's about finding that sweet spot and that's really hard to do, but it'll be good to talk about. And that's, this'll, this'll spur that. Cool. So then the other question we have is uh, real scalability of Cas9 based strategies to gold standard diagnostic kits, main limitations to overcome. Pietro from University Hospital, Tuberchin. Um, so there are some Cas9 based strategies for diagnostic kits. I mean, our, you know, Sherlock and other CRISPR diagnostics um, or Cas12 and Cas13 based because they have a special enzymatic activity um, that enables uh, sensitive detection. Cas9 is harder to make work for diagnostics, but there is like the CRISPR chip paper that came out this past year where they can um, do some sort of electronic sensing of Cas9, uh, recognizing a DNA target. Um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. I mean, the, ch the only, this test I'm aware of basically uses some sort of graph graphing based uh, chip that's hard to produce and expensive. So I think they have to figure out their manufacturing issues um, as well. Um, and I guess applying it to gold standard diagnostic kits. I mean, there are there have also been some Cas9 based strategies for triggering other uh, application methods like near. Um, a lot of it's like quite academic. There isn't anything that's quite ready for prime time or ready to deploy. So I'm not sure if we'll see Cas9 based diagnostics anytime soon, but um, the Cas12 and Cas13 ones are much, much closer um, and ready to, to scale and produce. Yeah. So, okay. Hey guys, we had a couple of other things come in the chat. One of them was, um, do you, are you do you have to be worried at all about the um, activity of the enzyme on on the strip while you're doing the test? Uh, well, I mean, we're still developing the final test, but you don't have to be worried at all about like you know using leveraging that for like a false positive or false negative. Um, currently, the way that these CRISPR diagnostic kits work is that you run a often a, a pre amplification reaction to make a lot to amplify the target that you will detect and you take that out and then put it in a CRISPR detection reaction and that will cleave a reporter. And then that essentially reaction pretty much goes to completion then you dip the strip in. Yep. Um, and there's not any you know, worry about additional side reactions. And of course these reactions, you know, you're not gonna get genome editing if you touch the strip, you know, it's like. Um, and then I think the biggest worry actually, um, and this is something that often happens um, in a lot of clinical labs uh, and is something that is a big question is that when you have these lateral flow based things, um, if you open up a tube and then stick the lateral flow component in, um, you're opening up a tube with a bunch of amplified product and that can spread everywhere. And the next time you do the test, um, you can get false positives because you're not detecting if someone has it, you just covered yourself with like this DNA um, that corresponds to the amplicon you're trying to detect. So that's a, that's a design problem that, you know, everybody's well aware of and, and is trying to solve um, with different ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the final product and final form of this will be um, quite easy to use, hopefully. And, you know, we always say it's going to be like a pregnancy test. It will not be exactly like a pregnancy test. You're not going to be able to like spit on something and, and like three minutes later, read it out. Um, they'll probably be a little bit more involved. But I think what really is needed for COVID and for many other diseases is something that's very easy and simple to use and safe to use. Is there, um, cool. uh, so somebody else also asked about um, if you would need FDA approval to use these in public. Um, my guess is yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah, 
I mean, technically the FDA has this uh, pipeline called Emergency Use, Author Use Authorization or EUA. Yeah. And that is not FDA approval per se. That's not saying, you know, this is FDA approved. You're just authorized to use it in an emergency. Um, but you can think of it as similar to that in the sense that you have to get the stamp of, you know, okay um, to be able to use this. And there's very good reasons for that because you don't want people peddling, you know, whatever as a test because I think that can lead to a lot of issues. Got it. So we got one more question. What are some other applications of CRISPR technology in related research? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, there's kind of how, you know, scientists have really incorporated CRISPR into all areas of biomedical research. I think the same applies for COVID. So, um, you know, using CRISPR to study the interactions of sort of host genes with COVID, I think is a very exciting area. So being able to do CRISPR knockout or CRISPR activation screens to find things that either enhance, uh, you know, either cell uptake of the virus or replication of the virus or repress it can be useful for understanding how the virus gets into cells and uh, actually produces. Um, and it could also be useful for finding, you know, other things that could be inhibited in the cell to sort of prevent infection of the virus. So I think a lot of groups have been uh, pursuing those types of methods. I think CRISPR can also be used not just for studying how the virus works, but also for therapeutics. So, um, you know, especially the RNA targeting uh, CRISPR enzymes like Cas13 uh, could potentially be used as a sort of therapeutic to knock down uh, the viral genome and prevent it from uh, producing at high levels. And so this could be akin to sort of siRNA knockdown as well, which I know uh, certain groups are doing or anti sense oligos. Um, Stanley Chi at Stanford actually had a good paper on this on using CAS13 to either vaccinate or um, treat people who have already been infected. Um, so I think those are already two um, exciting areas CRISPR could be used um, sort of beyond diagnostics. Yeah. 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 I know we, we've definitely be, we've been uh, trying to collaborate already with some groups that um, have built, uh, you know, a few. Uh, uh, episodes of CRISPR office ago, we talked about a group that developed this interactome uh, map uh, of the virus. So we've actually been trying to use CRISPR to help this group knock some of these genes out and determine if they're functionally relevant for uh, uh, the viral infection. And uh, yeah, actually it looks like, um, Aditya, thanks for putting down that, that link on the screen there. So we actually have a webpage now where you can check out some of the things we're working on with groups, uh, see some other uh, resources around COVID-19 research, some papers that we think are great, some protocols and um, uh, also talk about the, the diagnostics like you guys have developed on there. So yeah, go check that out. Right yeah. there, synthigo.com slash coronavirus. Uh, you guys can get all the resources, various uh, publications we've come across and things that we think will be helping folks in the lab as well as uh, in industry also as well. Uh, we did, there was another question came uh, from through the chat real quick. Maybe you guys can just talk about this. And actually it relates to the next slide, I guess. Um, so you got, you know, what is the, you talked a little bit about the, maybe some of the challenges, like if you're building a diagnostic and you talked about the Cas9 ones with the CRISPR chip technology, um, you know, and there, I guess you could also use that for other types of nucleases too, that the chip, but what would be, what, what's a, um, uh, what's really uh, one of the biggest challenges you face if you wanted to scale um, like the diagnostic part, the diagnostic test? I mean, I think that, of course, getting strong validation and that is both in uh, kind of precludes scaling, but also or but also is part of scaling where you scale it up and make sure that you've tested on enough people to make sure that it really is accurate. Um, that's one thing. But then it's really the chemistry and the device. So how do you scale up the chemistry and how do you manufacture enough devices um, or, you know, even if it's simple to strip be able to give to everybody. Um, you think the chemistry would be easy? I mean, you know, we can make boatloads of protein here, but obviously, you know, there's not too much complex stuff in QBCR mix and they had questions, you know, at certain points of, you know, are they producing enough kits? So the DNA and RNA and protein synthesis that goes into these reactions um, is a, a consideration scaling as well as the actual manufacturing of whatever sort of test strips and plastic and fluid handling and heating elements that may be needed. Um, and then of course, there's also distribution. You know, as scientists, we often don't think about, you know, oh, I'll make this and it'll be fine. And like, we'll get to everybody. But like, you know, you have to ship it to places. You have to make sure that people use it. You have to make sure that there are easy ways to report on it. There are apps, 
maybe like how we feel that you can take a picture of your test strip and then we'll report it to a central server and get that back to your doctor and also get it to your local, you know, state health department. Um, you know, I think a big thing about scientists is that we spend so much time in the lab or, you know, in the office that we don't think about, you know, what the real challenges are in the real world. And it's been an interesting learning experience, learning, you know, how to scale it, distribute it, you know, work with different government agencies to do that. Um, so all of those different considerations are important um, and we're trying to address all of them at the same time. So it's um, been exciting and all we can say is that we're hoping for the best. Cool. So we're, we're back to the, we're back to the model here and we're, we're looking, we're thinking about the, the transition. I know you, I asked you guys this, how you think uh, maybe research is going to change. Um, do, do you have any, uh, have any, I guess, uh, notions or suggestions about like how labs can move into this transition phase? Like once, you know, uh, the, the numbers of infections start go, going down and we can relax the social distancing, uh, what it's going to look like in this transitory period for, for labs like, like yours? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of discussions about what that could look like, you know, either, you know, you slowly start bringing one or two people back with more time sensitive projects, or you start maybe doing shifts where, you know, certain people can come in the morning, certain people come in the afternoon, as to sort of still allow for some level of social distancing. Um, but I think the most important thing is to be able, if you're going to start reopening, is to be able to uh, track outbreaks as they start to reoccur, because um, it's a given that we'll see a second wave as we try to start coming back online without vaccination or broad sort of herd immunity. And so we need to have some sort of uh, either you know, workplace or uh, city level testing that can ensure if someone's coming into work, they're not actually testing positive. Um, and so uh, that level of testing doesn't quite exist yet. I mean, we're doing pretty well in sort of labs, uh, you know, for hospital based testing. Um, but to do like population scale testing to um, ensure workplaces don't become uh, filled with people who are sick, uh, we still have a ways to go. And I think that's going to be very uh, important uh, for reopening. And so, yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if we can help contribute to that effort. Yeah. Cool. So thank you, Jonathan Omar. Um, so Kevin, real question, uh, quick question here. Who's going to be joining us on uh, Kills for Office Hours next week? Yeah, actually, uh, just to, to say thank you, uh, Jonathan and Omar, for your, your time today. We really appreciate that. And thank, thank you to the audience for, uh, for tuning in. Next week, um, if you want to move the slide, we're going to be joined by um, a professor and also associate director of a core facility at University of Alabama, Birmingham, Laura Lambert. And she's going to be talking about um, how she's had to adapt her work and her life during uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, and Aditya, do you want to just remind our audience today how they can get one of our um, Keep Calm and CRISPR on t-shirts? Yeah. So synthego.com slash calm is where you can get your Keep Calm and CRISPR on t-shirts. I think I said calm four times in, in that sentence. Uh, so as always, we're really um, excited to host these office hours and create this community and forum for people to interact. And with that, I want to say a special thanks to our guests, Jonathan and Omar and our audience. And also it's been a pleasure to constantly host with you, Kevin, and uh, enjoying your cat coming in every now and then making guest appearances. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's it. I think thanks again. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, I, I know you, I know you guys are waiting for your CRISPR, uh, uh, sorry, your, your, um, your Uber eats order. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We just put a CRISPR secret order in, you know, it's not all you can eat sushi, but we're talking about CRISPR office hour. So uh, yeah. thanks guys for hanging out and we appreciate your time and, uh, and your expertise. So yeah, um, yeah. Or, you, yeah. you guys again. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. And, uh, tune in next week. Stay safe. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.